Greetings, fellow recording nerds. So a couple of weeks back, I did a video called 15 things to avoid when you're recording at home. And you guys absolutely loved it. I got some great feedback and it inspired me to make a new Monday morning series called how to not completely f up your recordings. Today's video is inspired by a viewer named Alex Christensen. I don't work in music, but as a film sound designer. During COVID, tons of actors have been doing their own ADR. Nine out of 10 times they f up and you just have to get them into the studio anyway. I kinda wanna show them this video to let them know they f up. Well, Alex, I can only imagine it's not just the actors at home making really bad recordings, but the singers as well. You know, those musicians who are too f***ing lazy to haul their gear into the venue before a show, or can't seem to tell time whenever there's a rehearsal scheduled. Yeah, we're relying on those guys to make a quality home recording. Sure, no problem. What could possibly go wrong? Well, as it turns out, there's lots that can go wrong. A couple of weeks ago, I said I'd make the video so simple that even your singer couldn't possibly fuck it up. Apparently, that was assuming just a little bit too much because fuck ups happen, not only for the inexperienced, but even for us studio veterans. So I've made a handy list of things to avoid when you're trying to record your vocals at home, then you send your tracks off to a studio to be finished off. Now, if you're completely new at this and you'd like to learn how a compressor works or how to apply EQ and reverb to your tracks without ruining the sound, I've got a three part lesson that you can sign up for absolutely free. It's called SMG Audio Basics and you can follow the link in the video description to get your copy. Let's get to it. Number one, point the mic the right way. Obvious, isn't it? Well, sometimes maybe not. Hell, back in 2016, I reviewed a cheap $30 Amazon mic and was in such a hurry to tell all the viewers out there how terrible it was, I didn't notice I had the damn thing backwards. As the saying goes, to err is human, but crumb help you if you ever make a mistake on the internet. This is the Shure PG81, and I'm gonna be honest, it's a little difficult to tell which direction to point it. Honestly, I got it wrong the first time I ever plugged it in. But if you take the time and flip the mic around and try both sides, you're gonna figure out which one's the right way pretty damn quick. Most mics will have some kind of indicator to help you figure out which way to point it. Some might not be so obvious. General rule of thumb is if it sounds weird, have a second look. The last thing you want is to have to redo your take because you missed the obvious. Or have to post a retraction video on YouTube like I did. Number two, pop filter. This is the most basic requirement for any decent vocal recording. You can find them for under 10 bucks, but I'm still surprised by how many people miss this. I mean, I remember checking out a PewDiePie video a few years back. He's narrating a video and it's sounding fucking terrible. It's like, wow, all those million dollars and you couldn't buy a fucking pop filter, dude? Simply put, hard consonants like P and K and D create blasts of air that overload the capsule on a microphone. A pop filter is a dual layer mesh that directs those blasts of air away from the microphone, yet allows the sound to come through. Now, some mics will come with their own pop filters, but these might not be enough or they're just too close to the capsule. So it's a great idea to have a separate pop filter on hand, just in case the included one isn't quite strong enough. That way we don't have to waste endless hours trying to clean up a vocal track with software and therefore saving you money. So this is a sound of a close vocal being mic'd without a pop filter. Now all the hard consonants, the P's, the K's and the D's create what are called plosives and don't sound that great. Now, when we put a pop filter in place, suddenly the plosives are no longer an issue. The P's and the K's and the D's don't seem to create that massive farting sound on the low end anymore. We get a much smoother sounding take. Number three, mic type. Now there's three main types of microphone, condenser, dynamic, and ribbon. Generally, most vocal mics are gonna be condensers. Now, condensers like this are basically a great big capacitor and require 48 volts of DC power called phantom power to operate. Most, if not all affordable interfaces have this built right in, so powering your mics shouldn't be a problem. Dynamics are the other main choice. They work like a speaker in reverse and don't require phantom power. 
Now, certain large diaphragm dynamics like the SM7B or the Rode PodMic are great for death metal screamers as they can handle the loud volume of your typical Cookie Monster wannabe. Just remember those mics need a lot of gain, so not all cheap interfaces will be capable of amplifying those without a shit ton of noise. Ribbon mics work on the same principle as the human eardrums. Early instances were very delicate and you could easily fry your mic if you accidentally applied phantom to it. There are some truly great modern ribbons out there, but might not be the best choice for hard rock and metal vocals. They're great on drum rooms though. Now, word of the wise, always turn your phantom power off before unplugging any microphone. I have definitely destroyed a few mics over the years because of exactly this. Save yourself some money and make sure you've got that shit turned off. Number four, file format. As discussed in my previous video, check with who will be mixing your project for the expected file format. Most studios will ask for 24-bit at 48 kilohertz, but you have absolutely nothing to lose by sending a text or an email to your engineer. An informed musician is a productive one. Number five, get your levels right. Now, recording to digital can be a little tricky. When overloaded, it doesn't round off the sound in a pleasing way, the way how analog tape used to. So we have to be very careful to stay out of the reds. We want to set the record level on our interface so the loudest part hits at the negative 6 dB mark. This will give us headroom and hopefully prevent any overs. Now, if you get one or two, that's not the end of the world, but if your tracks look like this, however, you definitely fucked up. And if you're recording too quietly, we're not going to get any useful information out of your track either. Once again, aim for the negative 6 mark. This is what happens when we've got too much gain on the mic. The signal is distorted and it just sounds awful. This is what happens when we've got too little gain on the mic, and it's just not going to be any good to anybody either. Now we're hitting about the negative six mark right around here, which is kind of what we want to aim for. So it's going to give us enough headroom and hopefully we'll be able to avoid overs. If it happens once or twice, no big deal. Just don't crank the living crap out of your mic because honestly, you don't need to do it. And I must add, please make sure you're tracking your vocals at your actual singing volume. Nobody wants to hear an ultra aggressive, brutal death metal screamer screaming quietly because his mom's in the next room and told him to keep it down. Number six, don't track your mic in Omni. Now, some condenser mics will have multiple patterns and these can be great for a lot of applications, but for the most part, as far as your vocals go, you want to leave your mic in the cardioid pattern, meaning it picks up what's in front of the mic. The trade-off being that cardioid pattern introduces proximity effect, which loads up the bass frequencies on your source. Now, some vocals out there will try and be smart and track in omni mode because there's no proximity effect. And then we all learn very quickly just how not fucking smart they truly are because proximity effect is usually desirable and the room they tracked in sounds like shit. That's right, when you switch over to omni, it picks up the sound from all directions, including the room where you didn't put any acoustic treatment because you blew your money on an expensive preamp you didn't fucking need. Do us all a favor. Leave your mic in cardioid and worry about your fucking performance. Now, we're backed off from the mic about a foot here and we don't get what's called a proximity effect. It's only when we come in close, like this, and I got to turn the gain down because of it, because obviously closer gives you a louder source, but we get much more bottom end in the sound. This can be a very desirable effect. And if we go right up on the mic, we can get an extremely pronounced effect, but the mic is more susceptible to plosives this way. So it's all about trading off and finding what works best with your voice. Number seven, track with minimum effects. Tracking with a little delay or reverb in your headphones can be fun, but if you overdo it, it's easy to cloud your performance. And if you can't hear what's really going on, you might as well not even bother. A little moderation goes a very long way. And please, for the love of crumb, do not print your reverb and delay effects into your tracks. We can do that in the studio later. No, really. Number eight, too many or too few takes. Don't hand the engineer 10 vocal takes and expect him to edit it together into what you want because there's a very good chance he'll just pick the first track and that'll be the end of it. You can edit your own stuff down yourself and create a master take of your best stuff. 
However, I find that only one main vocal track might not be enough as I tend to prefer the sound of a doubled main vocal. One great track is awesome, but two great tracks are even better. I do recommend discussing this with your engineer ahead of time and you can both decide on what's the best approach for your project. Number nine, headphone and click bleed. It's always a good idea to track your vocals wearing a set of headphones that will isolate the playback. The last thing you want is to be singing a soft passage and hearing a click track bleeding through. Personally, I don't get the idea of singing with a click track. A count in, that's absolutely fine. But I'd prefer to hear the singer perform with the music, not to a fucking grid. Number 10, keep your fucking hands off the fucking mic. Now, I've already said this numerous times, but seriously, stop coming the mic, you dumbasses! Look, I get it, you're used to playing gigs with your band at the local community center or your sister's birthday party. And generally, that means a really shitty PA that's just not capable of delivering the volume required to amplify your voice correctly. So that usually means cupping the mic, which will make your vocals louder. And because human perception is flawed, and I do mean you super tough, brutal death metal guys out there, louder always seems better. Except we're making a recording not appearing at your sister's birthday party, and we've got a volume fader that will make things louder. When you cup the mic, you wind up making things smaller because you change your mic's pickup pattern from a cardioid to an omni. So it loses proximity effect and therefore bottom end. And because you just put your hand around your mouth, you lose a lot of the top end definition and interfere with your lips' ability to form words correctly. So instead of getting the larger than life brutal death metal sound that you're after, the reality is you wind up sounding like a mid-range heavy version of Boomhauer from King of the Hill. And I'll hear this constantly from vocals. You just don't understand the type of vocal sound I'm going for. To which I reply, no, I know exactly the type of sound you're going for, but you're just too fucking stubborn to realize I'm trying to help you get it, dumbass. But this vocalist from copy paste the autotunes does it all the time. Yes, and I guarantee that a sound engineer called him an idiot. Keep your fucking hands away from the fucking mic. We can make it louder in the mix. No, really. Here's an SM58 typical stage mic scene the world over. Here's what a death metal growl sounds like when you keep your hands off the mic. Here's what happens when you cup the mic. Yeah, it's a little louder, but sounds so much more awesomer, doesn't it? Number 11, a little space. One of my favorite tricks when doing background vocals is to have the vocalist step back from the mic a foot or two. If I am layering multiple vocal tracks, adding a little bit of physical distance between the mic and the vocalist makes the tracks blend together better. Have the lead vocal dead on and then add space as you add more and more tracks. Of course, the background tracks won't sound the greatest on their own, but we're blending tracks. Throw the faders up and you'll be surprised by just how they sound as a whole. Now the bottom line, when you're recording vocals at home, don't assume anything. Talk to your engineer and find out what's expected before you start putting endless hours into your incredible performance that's bound to take the music world by storm. Because the last thing you're gonna wanna do is do it over again.